Well, I think it's important before we, we move forward here, we talk about some of the top foods. For people tuning into the video, they can see your book cover back there and get a basic idea of some of them. Spinach and chard. <laughs> a couple of the top ones there. So let's talk about what the top foods are that people want to be aware of. Spinach, chard, and beet greens are off the chain, high in oxalate and pretty bioavailable. Nuts like almonds, cashews, and peanuts big problem. They're very uh, used in large quantities. Black and white beans, bran, turmeric, a lot of seeds like chia and hemp, beets, sweet potatoes. I really messed myself up making sweet potatoes my daily starch. So our daily bread was my sweet potato. <laughs> oh man, that was a mistake. And the one nobody wants to hear about is cacao or dark chocolate or cocoa powder being very absorbable, used widely in science because you can easily get a volunteer to come in and drink some hot cocoa or eat a piece of chocolate and then see what the oxalate does in the body. Um, so it's very clear that that's bioavailable oxalate and gets into the body beautifully and shows up in the urine and so on. Well, let's get really practical with people because those that's a lot of different foods you've named there. And a lot of them are going to appear in you know different recipes and eating out, eating at a friend or family member's house which comes back to the point I made early on, the fact that the goal isn't to get down to zero. So with the foods you just mentioned, the ones that are highest in oxalate, should the average person be totally avoiding those? Or how do we go about changing our diet in a practical way? Well, you know, I think um, depending on how severely you're trying to protect your health and your family's health, what you define as practical is a personal thing. And wanting to just blend in with today's food fads is uh, a, r a risky behavior. Uh, but if you look at your biology and what the science is telling us, the science tells us we can handle about 150 milligrams of oxalate a day, which is about 50 per meal, which is about five spinach leaves. Per meal. Baby spinach leaves per meal, five spinach leaves. Whereas people are literally buying these massive clamshell boxes of spinach and using half pound or more of spinach every day. That is really toxic. Well, the trouble with all this is, you know, the topic or the title of your book is toxic superfoods. We've been told not only are these foods okay, but these are the healthy foods we should be eating. So it's, it's a real paradox. It's a real crime, actually, that we're ignoring science we've had for a long time. We've known that spinach chelates calcium and can cause calcium deficiency, particularly in infants and children, and absolutely should not be used for children. And yet, right from the get-go, people from the medical society said, well, we'll just ignore that because the other greens are fine. And so we'll just pretend that's not happening. And we've been basically getting a very skewed picture of things. And then at more recent times, somebody put out this idea in the 80s that these compounds and petri dishes have these anti-inflammatory effects. And we got the notion that plant compounds are great, heroic, anti-inflammatory things that protect you from old age and get in the way of oxidative stress in the body and all this. And it's not how it works at all. And so we've got we built this into our culture, thinking that these phytonutrients are great. And nobody's warned us about the science we've had for 100 years. It keeps getting re reconfirmed many times over that oxalic acid is a serious anti-nutrient that causes calcium deficiency and causes electrolyte disturbance in ways that can um, cause long-term serious health consequences. And we knew in 1940 that you eat too much rhubarb and it makes you sick. This should be common knowledge and it's not. Well, coming back to that story of the rhubarb gets me thinking about how the food industry has changed so much more recently, where we have access now to these high oxalate foods 24-7, 365, versus before when we had more seasonality with what we had access to. So naturally, I would assume there'd be periods of time throughout the year where we would have lower oxalates in the diet and give our body a chance to clear out if we've accumulated. Whereas now we can just go and get spinach you know, every day at Whole Foods and keep hammering it into our green smoothies and never give our body a break and keep accumulating. Everywhere. And you don't even have to go to Whole Foods. You go to a convenience store at a gas station and you can get green stuff in jars. You can get iced tea, which is another one I didn't mention. 
You can get peanuts in little packages. You can get all kinds of things that and now like the little snack bars and stuff, they're loaded with chimp and chia and all these seeds and stuff and chocolate isn't everything. I mean, try to find an ice cream flavor without chocolate in it. Like it's everywhere. And absolutely, it was about 50 years ago when here in the US, the 24 hour grocery store became the thing and you could shop any time of day and get start getting things from all over the world, even 50 years ago. That's the whole point of the railroad system and the interstate highways is to be able to move these agricultural products around because agriculture is so central to economies. So you gave us the baseline there. I think you said it was 150 milligrams that we want to have as our maintenance on a daily basis, keep our oxalates below that. Is that correct, the number? Right. That's what the the science seems to indicate what, what the renal handling, that is how well the kidneys can manage it and get it out of the body. 150 to 200 pretty much is where ki- kidney capacity is, which doesn't address the capacity of your gastrointestinal tract or your liver because it goes from your mouth to your stomach. And right away, it's starting to get into your bloodstream in the stomach and the upper intestines is where a lot of it starts absorbing into the blood. And all that circulation that's taking care of your stomach and intestines goes straight to the liver. Everything that comes from your food has to go to liver for being processed. And, you know, vitamins are picked up and stored and and things are detoxed and handled. But with oxalate, oxalic acid is the the primary one. The, The calcium oxalate crystals are mostly just abrasive and damaging to tissue, but don't get directly into the blood. What gets in there? It's oxalic acid and it goes straight to your liver, uses up glutathione because the liver has to protect itself. It can't detox oxalate. You do not detox oxalate. The liver, remember, makes oxalate. So the blood that leaves your liver is not lower in oxalate from what you absorb. It's higher in oxalate. And that blood goes straight up from the liver an inch past the diaphragm to the heart. Then it goes, the blood goes straight from your liver to your heart, key organs to your lungs to pick up oxygen, back to your heart again. And this is all full blown high oxalate after every meal. And if you eat peanut butter on whole wheat toast for breakfast and have some kind of spinach salad for lunch and have sweet potatoes for dinner and chocolate ice cream for dessert, you've nailed yourself four times a day. Um, in your liver and your heart and your lungs and your circulatory system. And then Eventually, the kidneys get a crack at taking it out of the blood. And we know that symptoms can be far reaching and, and this can affect all the different tissues in the body. But as you went through that pathway, liver to heart to lungs, circulation, kidney, are those the top tissues that we see are affected by this? And then it kind of just dissipates from there? Well, we definitely see gastrointestinal issues. So that's happening even before it gets into your bloodstream where it's being um affecting the surface, the inner surface of your digestive tract. And then there's your nervous system being affected. Your The liver effects are really kind of hidden. But what I think is happening is that some of us end up more and more over time sensitive to chemicals because our liver can't handle the chemicals as well. We're not able to handle our booze very well. Uh, and that's a sign of liver stress. And an oxalate could be really draining your liver of its antioxidant powers because it's protecting itself from your spinach and your sweet potato and your dark chocolate gorging, which is very fashionable right now that you can just turn dark chocolate into anything now and cocoa powder and mix it up with almond butter and sweet potatoes and call it a brownie and really concentrate this oxalate and eat it over and over again and show other people how to do it and give it to your children. This is the reason it's important for the message to get out because people have completely unaware that the oxalates they're lingering is a problem. I want to keep coming back to the practical aspect and how people can adopt what we're talking about today into their own healthy lifestyle. And coming back to that 150 to 200 milligrams a day, given that things like vitamin C and even some amino acids we're taking in plus vegetables are going to have oxalates plus there's the body making oxalates through the breakdown of tissues how do we go about assessing that in a a way with any form of reliability 
assessing our degree of toxicity? Well, is staying within mean? the level of 150 to 200 because there is so much variability. If somebody's taking, and again, we have control over most of these, like you know, vitamin C intake for taking that as a supplement, and and the amino acids that would get a bit more tricky trying to you know calculate how many we've taken in, and and then with the vegetables, and then with Tissue, you mentioned tissue breakdown and how that adds to the oxalate burden. So when we're talking about 150 to 200, does that include the tissue breakdown as well? Or is that just dietary? That's a really great question. And the thing is, this is there's no really honest, precise number, right? Because of all these variables, as you suggest, and all the genetic differences, the, the difference is age, like children can't handle near the amount that adults can because their kidneys don't clear it as well. So depending on your state of health and what else is going on at the moment, how much you tolerate in the short run, it's the bigger question is, could we just acknowledge that certain foods absolutely blow apart our basic fundamental tolerance and just simplify it? Because in real, in the real practical world, Sometimes all you have to do is stop eating spinach and almonds and your arthritis goes away and your sleep gets better and your energy gets better and and your life starts working better. And, and that's for some people, that's good enough. You just need to know that you might be feeling horrible and it might be because of the green smoothie that you are using to feel less horrible. It's so easy to layer them on. I mean, we talk about almonds. We could be using an almond milk in the smoothie, putting, you know, the the greens, so putting in the spinach and adding a little bit of turmeric to get the anti-inflammatory and and add some berries, some, you know, blackberries and raspberries. It, it goes on and on. You can just and have a <laughs> and some nut butter. Yeah, some peanut butter in there too. Or so it can be <laughs> It can just be this bomb of oxalates hitting your body. I can only imagine the number if we were to take all that and calculate. And the irony in all of this is this is is supposedly a healthy, coming back to our point from before, this is supposed to be somebody that, well, it is somebody that is making, quote unquote, a good decision and, and going out of their way to pick these ingredients at the grocery store and put them together and eat thoughtfully to try and rectify health issues and stay healthy. So it's just, there's just such a paradox to all this. And I just feel for people trying to navigate. It's so unfair. It violates my sense of fairness because those of us who are trying to eat well are making all this expense of time, effort, and thought and energy going into it, thinking we're doing ourselves some good. And it might seem okay in the short run, but when things start unraveling, you never suspect your favorite sweet potato, in my case, or your green smoothie, or your almond habit, or your secret chocolate habit, or it might just be a secret potato chip habit, because potatoes are enough. <laughs> but we can be doing stuff and never, I think, you know, it, to me, it's just disturbing because it's so unfair, because we're listening to the messages of the day, being good kids, doing what we're supposed to do to be responsible to our health, and no one's warning us that that's actually doesn't work. Well, the other challenge to all this too is the fact that different people that are influential in the health world are saying different things. So this is one message from Sally where we're avoiding oxalates, but then, you know, I've had so many different experts on the show over the years saying to avoid this and that, this and that, we start layering all these on top of each other and it's like, what do people yeah. do? So that's another whole layer. I mean, lectins, we have Dr. Gundry on here a number of times talking about lectins, avoiding those. And 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 then again, the whole paradox is not just saying some of these things are neutral, but some people say things like polyphenols are advantageous and we want to get as many as we can. And then in your book, you're saying no polyphenols. So it's 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 I just feel again for people and and all I can do is bring different information to light and and try and sort it for myself and and people can experiment and see what works for them and what resonates but the mixed messaging is another whole layer to the complication of of trying to figure this out i 100 percent squarely are right there with you and i never really wanted to be in the space of like 
eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this. Like never, I mean, I was an academic, that's an easy way to cop out, you know, and not have to take a public stand on what's true or not and not be wrong in public. And I've been wrong plenty in the past because I was a vegetarian and a vegan and um, teaching in the public sphere, turning elderly lunch programs into like veggie-based, plant-based stuff years ago before it was a thing. I had blood on my hands, I was wrong. And I paid the price personally, and then I did all this research, and I'm working with people, and honest to God, rubber hits the road in the real world. And if you expl- if you experiment with this in your real life, truth starts to reveal itself, and you find yourself feeling like you're unmoored, because our culture is so bent on thinking plants are safe and benign, that it's really uncomfortable for people, and that... that Social psychological dissidence keeps people afraid to question these rudimentary beliefs that are completely, it's like, I think of it as like mold hyphae in our heads. Like we're so embedded in this thinking that we're trapped emotionally. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. People are literally buying these massive clamshell boxes of spinach and using half pound or more of spinach every day. That is really toxic. I was looking back at this thing that I really love. I wanted to share this with you.